Well, this past week, I came across these amazing pictures of some sea life that I want you to see for just a moment. These are called sea anemones. anemones. They're beautiful, and they, they're found underwater, and it's the perfect, I mean, they're different colors, different shapes, but they all have this one thing in common. They are not what they appear to be. This is not a plant. This is a carnivorous animal. It, it loves fish, to eat fish. What it does is it's so beautiful, the fish think it's plant life. And so the fish come as the predator on the plant life to get something to eat. But when they get close to these anemones, they inject a poison in the fish that stuns them and then ultimately leads to an excruciating death. They cover over the entire fish, eat it whole, and then digest it. Now, why do I show this picture to you? Because that is in living color what te temptation is all about. When, when you're tempted, it, the temptation never looks evil or bad. It, it doesn't look like it's going to hurt you. Actually, actually, it looks like something you'd like. But the temptation just woos you in and draws you in. And the closer you get, you think, ooh, and you can smell it better. And it just, it just keeps getting closer and closer until finally it has you. And if you look at the, the book of James, it says that it eventually, once you take that step, it leads to death. Death on many different levels. This morning, I want to talk to you about temptation. And why? Because it is part of the model prayer. Remember, we're, we're dealing with the model prayer that Jesus gave the disciples in response to what the kingdom is like, and here's what people in the kingdom do, and here's how you, you continue to talk to the Father. How do, you, how do you get through to God? The model prayer is not there for you to memorize and just recite. The model prayer is there to help you see what kind of attitudes we need to develop, how we should approach God, what's the topics, what are the topics that God wants us to talk to him about, what, do, what does he want to say to us. That's all in this model prayer. So I want you to look at it again. We're going to look at the model prayer. And I want you to say it out loud with me one last time today. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, go back to verse 13. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open them up. We're going to spend most of our time in the Gospel of Matthew. But I want you to look at this, this prayer again for just a moment. Matthew I mean, Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, it goes all the way through verse 14, as a matter of fact. But look at verse 13 again. It says, and do not lead us into what? Temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, I'm separating the, the first clause and the second clause. This week, we're going to deal with, and lead us not into temptation. And then in the following week, next week is Mother's Day, so we're not going to deal with this uh, next week. But the following week, we're going to deal with the second part that says, deliver us from evil, which more specifically is translated, but deliver us from the evil one. And we're going to talk about spiritual warfare, and we're going to talk about the, 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 the mastermind behind uh, temptations today, but we're going to go into much more detail then. But that's what we're talking about right here. This verse, verse 13, do not lead us into temptation. What is, what is he saying here? I mean, if you want to know what that verse means, just by what it says, what he's saying is, you and I, when we approach God to pray, our attitude ought to be, God, we are vulnerable to temptation, and we're prone to being seduced. Help. That's what God wants. He doesn't want you to come to him cocky. God, I've been a Christian for a while. I know how to deal with this. Go help somebody else who needs it. No, God says, beware. I want you to come to me humbly, knowing how susceptible you are to temptation and confessing that to God and saying, God, if you don't get involved in my life here, I'm going to fall. I'm going to crash. That's, that's why it's in the model prayer. God is trying to develop in us uh, an attitude of humility, of dependence upon him. And that only happens when we're saying, Lord, lead us not into temptation. We're saying, God, if, if I move in that direction, I'm hopeless. That's what he's talking about right here. Now, before we jump in, I, uh, the message I want to talk to you about today is about how do you deal with temptation. And there was a great model. Jesus gave us a great example uh, in two of the Gospels, as a matter of fact, Mark and, and Matthew. And it walks through how Jesus was tempted in, in three different areas. And it tells us how he got through those things. We're going to look at that in a minute. But I want you to know that the word temptation itself can also be translated test or trial. It's the same Greek word. 
And so sometimes the difficulty is when we look at these things, we think, well, God's not in it. I mean, if, if this is really more of a test, this temptation is more of a test, then God's really not in it to help us. Well, that's, we need to make sure we translate it properly and correctly. The, the word itself can be translated test, trial, or temptation, but the way you know what word to be used there is based upon the context of the passage. We know from James chapter 1 that God is not tempted and he tempts no one. Flat out says that verbatim. So we know it can't mean that God uses that when this word is used in the context of how God relates to us, it's never used in the form of temptation. Because temptation is always a word used to describe taking us down, not building us up. Whereas tests in the scripture are all about building you up and, and developing you into the man or the woman that God wants you to be. So there's two different kinds. So I'm going to give you the two, two examples right now. In Matthew chapter 4, which is the passage we're going to spend most of our time with, when we're talking about Jesus being tempted by Satan in those th three ways, it says in verse 1, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be what? tempted by the devil. That's the word temptation there. And it goes on. And after he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you're the son of God, then turn these rocks into bread. Um, so what we have here is an accurate usage of the word as tempting or temptation or tempter in this way. But that's, it is always to, to degrade. It's always to take you down. It's always to spoil. Temptations are never meant for your good. Temptations are meant to hurt you, especially long term. But then when you get around to translating it test, let me give you an example of that. In James chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. That's the word here. By the way, the word is pyrosmos. But this is the Greek word here. When you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing, which is a verb form of that word, the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. God uses tests to sand us down, to shape us, to encourage us, to build us up. There's pain associated with the tests as there is pain associated with temptation. But temptation's goal, temptation's desire is to take you down, whereas a test and a trial is intended by God to bring you through the fire, to burn out the impurities so that you become more perfect or mature, as the scripture says. Now, with that in mind, we're going to look at this time when Jesus was tempted. This is not a test. He's being tempted here by the tempter. It's found in chapter 4 of Luke, chapter, and I want us to look at it. Let me just read to you part of this so you see the big picture first. Luke 4, verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he became hungry. Yeah, no kidding. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And then Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. And then he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, it shall all be yours. And then Jesus answered and said, he quotes scripture again, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then he led him to Jerusalem, and he had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written. This is Satan's way of saying, look, I can play this same game. I'll quote verse, scripture verses to you, too. You think it's, it's just enough for you to do? Well, I'm going to quote it to you. And here he quotes some scripture. Verse 10, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And then Jesus answered and said to him, It is said, and he's quoting scripture again, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. That sounds good. He's going to be back. Now, what you have here is Jesus, who is God in the flesh, being tempted in every way. These are the big three. 
But it, the scripture says that he was tempted in many other ways too. But you need to know in the book of Hebrews, it says that Jesus was tempted in every way we've been tempted, but he never sinned. He did it as a model for us, but also that he, he did it because he became a man in order to go to the cross and die on, in our place. Now, while we watch Jesus and as he went through this, there are some major lessons to be learned as it, as it deals with temptation. You want to know how to deal with the temptations that should come your way? Follow Jesus' example. And that's what we're going to do today. I'm going to give you. Now, if, if you're a guest, look inside your worship guide. There's a note sheet to follow along. And this is so that you don't have to write down everything because I say a lot of words. Uh, but this way, you only have to fill in a few, okay? Number one, I want to talk to you about the field-tested tactics of Jesus as he dealt with his temptation. Number one, don't be blindsided by the temptation that comes after a major victory or success. Don't be blindsided when you're so successful. Look at verse 1 of Luke 4. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, and then four words returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. Jesus returned from the Jordan. What is so significant about that? That just seems like, you know, filler. It's almost like, okay, well, he just came from Jordan. What does that mean? What happened on the Jordan River right before he gets here was amazing. I mean, up to this time, people have been praying, God, please send us a deliverer, send us a Messiah, someone who will who'll set us free from this bondage of the, the Romans, and please, God, please. And, and finally, this guy comes on the scene, John the Baptist, who says, I am here and called by God to prepare the way of the Lord. And so he goes down to the Jordan River, and he says, I want, I'm calling on all the people to repent and turn to God. Repent of your sins so that the, the one who's coming can call you as his own for the establishment of the new kingdom. So people are pumped. They're excited about this. The Messiah's really coming, and he preaches it as though it'll happen any day because he knew it would happen any day. And so he was baptizing lots of people. People were coming from everywhere. They were lined up. They were all excited. Yeah, we want to be as ready as we can be for the Messiah. And then who shows up? Jesus. And Jesus shows up on the edge, and John, while he's baptizing, he looks up and goes, Behold! It's him. It's the one I've been telling you about. He's the, new, the Messiah. He's the one. I'm unworthy. I, I, I'm unworthy to tie the, the strings on his sandals. He's the one. So you can just imagine the crescendo, all the emotions. People are saying, it's him. It's really that time. It's exciting. People are saying, it finally happened. And then Jesus walks out into the water and says, John, I want you to baptize me. Well, it's only natural for John to go, no way. You baptize me. I can't baptize you. He says, no, you don't understand. You must baptize me. It's got to be done to fulfill scripture. But also, I want, to, I want to do this. And so John did it reluctantly. And when he did, then the Holy Spirit came upon him at that time. And people knew, here's the Lamb of God. Jesus then walks out of the water and immediately makes a beeline for the wilderness where he'll be tempted by Satan. Jesus, <laughs> from Jesus' perspective... Now it's been the inauguration. It's time to go to the White House. He, I mean, everybody's been excited about this moment for a long time, and now he's there, and it's time for him to be the king of the kingdom and to live it out. It's at that moment when he's inviting temptation. You know, Satan, he, Satan thinks that he can defeat Jesus. He can't. He's tried. He's already been conquered. But he thinks, ah, I'll get him when he's weak. Because he'll be still kind of living off the, the announcement that he's finally arrived. He's very vulnerable at that moment if he's not paying attention. And that's the point here. Don't be blindsided. When things are going great for you, you're right one step away from falling hard and crashing based on a, on a temptation of yours. But, but we feel the opposite. Man, I'm doing great. Go ahead, bring it on. I can, up, I can withstand any kind of temptation when you're feeling good, when you've already had some major successes and weakness. But you need to know when you have a major success and weakness, you are vulnerable. And even Jesus was. And Jesus was still able to deal with it, but I guarantee you, he didn't ignore it. Now that's number two. Let me give you the second field-tested tactic. Re-examine your current relationship with God. Re-examine your current relationship. You know, normally I would say re-examine your personal relationship, but I, but I really want you to zero in on where are you right now between you and God? How are you and God doing? I want you to see again, verse 1 of Luke 4. It describes Jesus two different ways. 
And, and I think these two different ways formulate a question for each one uh, for us. I'll give them to you. Look, look, at, um, look at verse 1 again. Jesus, here's the first phrase, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, and was, and here comes the second one, and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. So there are two phrases here, full of the Spirit and led around by the Spirit. What's he talking about here? What's the difference? One of those descriptions is about the identity of Christ. The other one is about the lifestyle of Christ. Full of the Spirit means here he is, God in the flesh. That's a, that's a re reference to him being totally God, as he said he would be. I mean, he, he, he is God in the flesh. And the question that raises for us is, who are, who are we aligned with? Who are we connected to? Has there ever been a time where you have repented of your sins, placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Believe that Jesus, when he died on that cross, took your sins upon himself and paid the penalty of our sin, which is death. Have you ever received him by faith, invited him to come and have say-so in your life? That's what it means to be a Christian. A Christian is somebody who didn't earn anything. A Christian is simply somebody who says, the truth is, I'm a sinner, and I believe that you, Jesus, died for me on that cross, and you now offer me life because you've been resurrected from the dead. A Christian is somebody who simply receives the gift and opens himself up and says, go ahead, I'm yours. When, when that happens, you've identified yourself with God. For you to deal successfully with temptations that come your way, your only hope is to do it in the power of God's Spirit. I mean, you can grit your teeth all you want and try to ignore it and close your eyes, and, but you'll, you know how, how prone you are to giving in. I do too. The only hope for you is to tie into someone who can be tempted and not fall, and that's only Jesus. So that's the starting point, and that's a tactical move. You, you want to give your life to Christ in order that you're in position for that to happen. And at the end of every message, I always invite you to do so and to actually invite. You don't have to wait for me to finish preaching. You, you can simply, in the quietness of this moment, just say, God, I, you don't even have to close your eyes to pray. Did you know that? Your eyes can be wide open and you can be praying to God and saying, God, I want what he's talking about. I wish I could, I wish I could get it for you, but I can't. But that's where it starts. And then there's that phrase, being led around by the Spirit. What does that mean? That tells you what he's doing. We're talking about his lifestyle. It says that he's watching where the Spirit is going and following him. It's no different than when Jesus looked at the disciples and, and, and looked at Peter and John and James and said, look, follow me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. Come on, follow me. And so who took the lead? Jesus did. And they followed after him. Here's an example of Jesus following after the Spirit of God. What are we, just, what are we hearing? It's, it's really the issue of obedience. It's obedience. A lifestyle of obedience. It's not about, well, I'm doing the best I can. It's, I'm watching wherever you go and I'm following you. So it raises the question. Is there anything going on in your life that you know is not pleasing to God? Are you being obedient in every way you know to be? Well, in most cases, that should be no. <laughs> I mean, it should be, yes, I'm trying, but there will be those times when I say no, and then I need to repent and go get back to that. But you're always going to be faced with things that you don't want to do, and... and and then it's up to you to whether or not you're going to obey God or not. Now, I can give you something very simple here. This is just, it, the scripture talks about when a person receives Christ, that they're to go public with their decision to follow after Jesus. And the Bible says the public way to do that is baptism. And that's why we, we have a baptistry over here. We baptize here. We're going to baptize at the beach in three, about three weeks or so on Memorial Day. Why do we do that? Because we want people to have an opportunity to go public with the commitment they made to Jesus. And, and the baptism is, the reason why this is such an appropriate way to do it, according to the scriptures, is that baptism tells the story. When you're, in the baptist, when you're in the baptistry there, or in the water, in the beach, whatever, when you go under the water, it's a picture of the death and the burial of Christ. But you'll notice that when they get down there, we don't let them go. Good luck, you know? Right? We don't do that. We actually keep our hands underneath and we pull them back up. And that is a picture of the resurrection of Jesus. When the, the word itself, baptizo in the New Testament, is a word that you would translate immerse or submerge. It's used to describe a ship that sunk. It's used to describe how you dye clothing. You don't sprinkle it, you literally immerse it into the, the dye. That's why we do it by immersion, not just sprinkling, by the way. 
We want to stay as true to the scriptures as we can. But why do we do it any, anyway? Because the Bible says that when you place your faith in Jesus, you are under obligation, obedience-wise, to be baptized. That's why even in the book of Acts, when you had thousands of people give their life to Christ, the very next thing it says is 3,000 people were baptized. I mean, why didn't they break it up? You know, don't, didn't they get kind of tired baptizing that many people all in one time? It's not an issue of whether it's convenient or wearisome. It's about they wanted to go public with their new decision to follow Jesus. So that's, that's just an easy way. I mean, so the question would be, have you ever been baptized by immersion after you invited Christ into your life? I mean, it's not about were you baptized as an infant. I was baptized as an infant. But that was more for my parents' sake. It was a more of a christening. or It was them dedicating me to the Lord. But you cannot, get, biblically, the baptism is an expression of your belief. Well, when I'm little, as a baby, and I'm getting baptized, I don't have a clue what's going on there. I, I was crying, I was told. I don't remember it. But I was crying when they were sprinkling me. And they, their hearts were in the right place, but that's not biblical baptism. That's more of a... God, we thank you for this child, and we dedicate him back to you. Biblical baptism is you going public about a decision you've made. What decision? The decision that says, I humble myself before you, Lord Jesus. You died for me on the cross, so I invite you to come into my life. That's why we don't baptize little children. We want to wait until they understand what they're believing. We don't want them just to do it because somebody else is doing it. We want them to personally understand the nature of sin and how Jesus, when he died, took care of their sin. We want that to happen. That's why we have a, ba a children's baptism class always before we do because we want the parents and the children to hear it. And if they're not ready, they're not ready. B baptism is all about understanding and then going public. That's just one area of obedience. There, it could be something as minor, but it's as huge as God saying, be kind one to another. All right, is there somebody you're not being kind to on the job or in your home? Well, the issue of obedience stands here too. If you choose not to be kind, then you're choosing to disobey God, which you're making yourself really open to this next temptation to crash and burn. So that's why you want to start here. I don't think it's any accident that it described Jesus as being full of the Spirit, but also being led by the Spirit. I think he wants us to get this. Number three, write this down. Third field testing tactic. Keep in mind the source of your temptation. Keep in mind the source of your temptation. Look back at verse 1 and 2 again. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by who? The devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they had ended, he became hungry. The source of this temptation was Satan. Why? Because he, his desire is to take us down. His desire is to take Jesus down. But, but what does the Bible say about that? I mean, are we helpless? I mean, do we, do we know that Satan's very strong. Are, are we going to be automatically falling because he, he's doing the tempting? No, listen to this. Satan tempts and he seduces you in order to intimidate you. But look at verse 8 of 1 Peter 5. It says, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So just know, that's in the heart of Satan. He's just going around looking for people to take down. And he will roar, in, trying to intimidate you, make you think that he already has your number. He's doing his best. Satan tempts and then seduces. But Satan can be resisted. Look at the very next verse, verse 9. But resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Now, what's really important here is, he says, resist him firm in your faith. You, you don't resist him just because you feel like resisting him. You don't stand in front of him and say, bring it on, baby. I've been a Christian long enough. I can deal with people like you. It doesn't happen that way. There's no room for cockiness or pride or arrogance. I mean, remember, it's all about humility. The reason it's in the Lord's Prayer is an expression to God that, God, if you don't get involved in this situation, I will fall then why does it say resist him? Because you can. But he says resist him according to your faith. What does that mean? We're going to deal with that in a minute. But just as a way of giving you a quick answer to that question, to, to resist him according to faith is to know who your enemy is and what it is that defeats the enemy. 
to resist him according to your faith is to know how to deal with the temptation when it comes your way and how to move forward. That we're, that's what we're going to deal with in a minute. So you do it according to your faith, not according to your feelings. Resisting temptation is not about how strong-willed you are. You'll be able to resist some temptations, but not all, especially if you're extra weak. So, number four, the fourth field-tested tactic. Keep your guard up when you are at your weakest. Not only after successes, but when you're at your weakest. Look at verse 2 of Luke 4 again. He was wandering in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they had ended, he became hungry. Do you think he was at a weak moment? Would you have been weak after 40 days of not eating? Of course. So he's at that point where he's, he's, got, he's starving. His body is in need of nourishment. Well, then Satan looks at that and says, I got him now. This is the perfect time to get him. He's weak. He'll give in because he'll just want to get rid of me so he can go and eat, eat a meal. But no. Whenever you are at your weakest, you need to take precautions. That's where, that's where guardrails come in. And, you know, when a car's driving, they have guardrails there to keep you from going over a cliff. Let me give you an example of this. You remember Josh Hamilton? He, he used to, he's playing for the Texas Rangers now. But he played for the Cincinnati uh, team when, when they had their spring season here. Josh Hamilton was touted as being one of the greatest hitters of all time, and that he would break all the records. He was an amazing guy, could hit home runs after home run after home run. But early on in his career, I mean, he had all kinds of people saying, here's the best of the best, and then he fell. Drugs and alcohol messed him up royally. About took his life. And, it, and then he met Jesus. And it changed his whole life, but he knew that he'd already gone down some roads that he would always be vulnerable to. So when he was here, he was my neighbor. This is how I know so much about him. I mean, he lived right across the street from me, and we talked, and he would bring me over to his car. He was so excited when he found out. When he gets to bat, um, they always play about 12 seconds of music as they're walking up to home plate before, and it's the player who gets to choose the music. And so he comes to me and says, Pastor Mike, I want, I want to know, do you think this song will work? It was from God is Not Dead. He says, I want to play this song so everybody knows where I stand every time before I take a bat, get up to, take a, uh, to bat. I thought, this is cool. That's his heart. He wanted, he was totally changed because of Jesus. But you know what else he did? And this was part of the agreement with the Reds as it was with the Rangers. He would not go anywhere without a coach. In fact, they hired a coach to do nothing but just be with Josh Hamilton. And not only that, Josh said, I'm not allowed to carry money. But I have to have money to pay for meals and all that stuff. So all my money that I have is in the pocket of the coach. And if it gets spent, it's because he gives me permission to spend it. Why did he do that? Because he knew. Just because he was drug-free at the moment didn't mean that there wouldn't come a temptation. And he knew that if he was at a weak moment, he'd crash and burn again. He'd done it many times. So he said before the Lord, he didn't want to do that again. We need to know what our weak points are so that we can take, make precautions. Especially when you're weak, that's when Satan is going to throw everything he can at you. Now let's move on, because I want us to deal, know how to deal with it. Number five, expect temptations in one of three main areas. And this is spelled out in 1 John, but Jesus deals with three different temptations that deal with a different facet of life. And so I want to read the 1 John passage. 1 John chapter 2, he sums it all up in one verse. Verse 15, he says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, that's temptation number one, lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, number two, and the boastful pride of life, number three, is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. So there are three primary temptations, and most people are only tempted by one of the three. And, 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 and there's just a diversity. I mean, I had people come up to me after the first service, and they said, oh, number three got me. That's where I am. I struggle with that all the time. Another guy came up and says, I deal with number one. I mean, that, that number one, that's my, it's the one that I'm always falling to. And, it, and so you need to know, these, one of these three is going to be the one that hammers you. Doesn't mean you can't be hit by one of the others. But you need to know that one of the three, and that's why, one of the reasons I believe, Jesus made sure to record in the scriptures his encounter with those three different temptations. So let me tell you what those three temptations are. The number one, the I need it now temptation. 
All right? Maybe you've been tempted that way. I need this now, right now. Well, verse 3 of Luke 4. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. Jesus dealt with it with truth, and we're going to talk about that in just a few moments. But understand, Satan is just trying to, to tempt him in one of the most basic areas of life. Did Jesus need something to eat? Yes. But is that what he needed most of all? No, most of all, he needed to honor the Father here. And Satan's getting him to try to compromise here. Satan's wanting him to be more concerned about immediate gratification of urgent needs than he is about the purpose of God for Jesus at that moment. The question we need to ask is not so much can we, but should we? I mean, obviously Jesus could have said to that stone, become bread, eat it, and it would have been totally, totally justified because he's got to do anything he wants to do. But he was here trying to teach us a lesson. When you're tempted by the lust of the flesh or the I need it now temptation, you need to understand that there is a God who has a great purpose for your life. And we need to answer those questions. Can we in the context of, is that what he wants? Will that please him? Then, number two, the second kind of temptation is the I want what he has temptation. I want what she has temptation. You see them wearing some clothes when they're coming to church. Oh, i got to have those shoes right there. Uh, you know, I want something like... It's just, I want whatever somebody else wants. There's a lack of contentment there. Look at verse 5. Luke 4, verse 5. And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Well, that's not entirely true either, but he's lying. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. <laughs> the crazy thing is, whether he, if he doesn't worship, it's going to all be his too. So Jesus answered him and said, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Again, he deals with the truth here. Satan wants you to settle for less. Always. He wants you to settle for... God has this incredible plan for your life. He's wired you in that way. He's designed you in a way to be perfectly suited for that. And it's so easy to mess that up by settling for something that's less than God intended. That's the, I want what he has temptation. We, we need to learn to be more content. We need to be content with God's plan because it's always best. And then that brings me to the third one. It's the, I want others to think I'm important temptation. None of you have ever felt that way, but, but some people in the churches down the street do. Luke chapter 4, verse 9. He led him to Jerusalem then and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. <laughs> See, I can quote scripture like you, Jesus. And Jesus answered and said, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. This is the temptation of pride, arrogance, the boastful pride of life is the way First John put it. This is the, I want people to think I'm important temptation. And you do what you do for that to happen. Which one is yours? Which one of those three do you struggle with? I mean, this boastful pride of life, they're the ones that say, image is everything. You want to make sure you dress right, you look right, you do right, so that others will be impressed. That's that temptation. I mean, there's nothing wrong with dressing right, looking right, and all that, as long as you're doing it for him, to honor him and these purposes for your life. But when it's all about you getting credit and you getting praised, when it's all about you impressing others and everybody else liking you, then you fall into that temptation. And you're going to find that if you fall into that temptation, then you're going to live the rest of your life hoping to please everybody. And you're going to be so frustrated because you can't ever please everybody. You can't hardly please anybody, you know? All right, number, five, number six. We're getting close. This is what you do when you're faced with the temptation. Follow Jesus' example when dealing with temptation. Follow Jesus' example. What, what was his example here? Number one, refuse to be intimidated. 
Just flat out refuse to be intimidated. Remember, the, 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 the Satan is roaring. Look, look at verse Peter 5, verse 8. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He just simply wants to intimidate you. And so he comes up to Jesus, and Jesus doesn't cower. Jesus doesn't bend. Jesus just stands there. That's not all that he does. He stood there, and he dealt with the accusations and the bargaining with the word, with the scriptures, with the truth. That's... But then verse 9 says, but resist him firm in your faith. At this moment, when Satan throws the temptation your way, he's trying to intimidate you. He's trying to get you to fall even before. You should even come close to falling. But it's here where you need to make sure you resist according to the truth, your faith, which is based upon the truth. Which brings me to the second thing. Make sure you respond to your temptation with truth. With truth. That's what Jesus did in each one of those cases. He just quoted back scripture and says, I know what you're saying, but this is what God says. I know what you're saying, but this is what God says. And I know what you're saying, and you're even trying to say that God said that too. But God would never say this. This is what we're going to stand on right here. God would never want me to compromise this for that. So you respond to the temptation with truth. Jesus just quoted scripture. You're familiar with Psalm 119, verse 11? Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not, what? Sin against you. There's power in God's word. Now we come to the third thing that Jesus did. And this is really where the rubber meets the road. This is the hard part. I mean, it's one thing to bow up and say, I belong to Jesus. You don't have authority and power over me. It's quite another thing to sit back and say, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says it, his word will prevent me from sinning against God, and there are other passages that would deal specifically with your temptation. It's one thing to do that, but when it, where the rubber meets the road is where you actually make a decision not to engage in that temptation. And that's where the third thing is. Resist temptation by denying self and obeying God. That's so simply stated, but so difficult to do. But this is what my pastor, Charles Stanley, says is the CMD, the critical moment of decision. When, when you're faced with the temptation, you know all the elements, and, and he's giving you lots of ends, Satan does. You can step in from here, you step in from here. I mean, he gives you lots of options because he's trying to remove all obstacles. He said, but when you're at that point where you know that the next step is what takes you down the tube, it's at that moment, at that moment, when you need to respond like Jesus. You choose not to. Jesus stood there and said, no. No. And thirdly, no. The critical moment of a decision is where you make the decision. Now, what does that mean? You may say no, and then that means you've got to get out of this spot. It may mean that you need to run, or it may, may mean that you need to get into the scripture and say, God, I need you to speak to me now. It may mean that you need to get on the call, phone and call somebody and say, I need some help right now. Help me to understand this. Help me to get out of this mind that I'm about to step into. And uh, There's a number of things there, but you have to say no. Now, why? Because that's what it means to take up your cross. Deny yourself. Matthew 16, verse 24. Jesus said to his disciples... If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus never said following him would be easy. But it's absolutely essential. When, it, when you're dealing with temptation, you have got to deny yourself. Now, how do you do that? Well, Paul spoke about it in Romans chapter 6. There are three verses here that kind of wrap it up and give you something to do. Therefore, verse 11... Do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. He's saying, don't give in to temptation. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. That's where you flirt with it. It's, and you get kind of halfway close just to check and say, well, just a little bit longer, a little bit further, a little. I mean, that's what he's talking about there. And then he says, he says, and do not go on presenting the members of your body as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. When you get that close to the temptation, you stop and you say, this hand, these eyes, this thought life, this heart is committed to him and it doesn't have anything to do with this. So you turn around and you go the other direction. That's what he's saying. You don't just bow up and say, no, you determine the next step. And it may be to, to run. I mean, the Bible says flee fornication and other youthly lusts. Flee. Run. Get out of there. Because he knows you can't handle it. Now, 
this is linked with the next truth, the next field-tested tactic. Seven, when the temptation seems too great, look for God's way of escape. God's always there. He's walking. He's there. He's watching what you do. And He knows that when you've taken that one step too far and you're saying, oh man, I'm starting to go. And God says, look for the way of escape. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he does not fall. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation, here it comes, will provide the way of escape also, so that you may be able to endure it. God will provide a way out. He knows how prone you and I are to falling. And even in, in our desperate need to get out, and we tend to stumble in it, God says, I'm still there. Come on over here. Here's the way of escape. And the way of escape may be, get on the phone and talk to a friend. The way of the escape may be, just go, get out of there right now. Turn, don't talk about this anymore, get out of there. Whatever's going on right there that would for, cause you to try to rationalize yourself to say this is okay. God says, get out of there. Now, number eight is bad news. Expect temptation to come in waves. You're used to being at the beach and a wave comes in, then there's the lull, then there's another wave. Listen to what it says, Luke 4, verse 13. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. That's God's way of saying, okay, you made it through this temptation, get ready. He's going to hit you the next time you're weak. He's going to hit you the next time you're open. He's going to hit you the next time that you're willing to consider. That's bad news. The good news is that God is going to give you the power to resist that temptation. But understand, it's just going to keep coming and keep coming and keep coming. You're never going to get to the point where you're not tempted anymore. Never. In fact, I found that the closer you get to the Lord and the more you want to do things for the Lord, the more you're struck with temptation. Because Satan's trying to get you out of that. He doesn't want you impacting the globe for the, for, the, for the kingdom. And then there's one last thing, number nine. And this is what we usually forget to deal with. Make time to learn lessons from your temptation. Make time to learn lessons from your temptation. Matthew 4, verse 11 says, Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. I mean, after the temptation, after you deal with it, God is going to do some things in your life. He's going to teach you some things on how to avoid that the next time, how to deal with it the next time. But there's one more verse, 1 Peter 5, verse 10. It says, After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. You need to know that God won't abandon you even if you fall into temptation. Actually, he's waiting for you to simply cry out and say, God, I'm stuck in this hole. Please help. And he'll be glad to take you and move you out of it. He'll never give up on you. But, but we need... Instead of waiting until we get in the hole to look up to God, we need to learn from the past hole experience. We need to write down you know, how slippery that slope was and what was it that actually led to my making that terrible decision that caused me to fall into temptation. There's always a series of, of decisions and steps that we take to get there. Look back at your last time and, 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 and evaluate it and analyze it and say, okay, I did this, so next time this comes around, I need to stop right here. You need to put up these guardrails in your own life to protect you, like Josh did. Now, I told you in the very beginning, though, you can work hard to try to overcome temptation, but until you place your faith in Jesus and you become aligned, identified with him, connected to him, you're powerless. You'll be able to resist some, but you're going to crash and burn one day, if not many days. So it all, you, it all stems back to your relationship with God. And, and more than just do you belong to him, are you living the kind of life that's represented by an obedient Christian? Somebody who's obeying God. It's more than just bearing the name tag, Jesus, I belong to him. It's about living that way. God says, if you belong to me and you start living for me, then you need to know I'm out front. I'm over to the side. I'm in behind. I'm under and atop of you, walking with you all the way. 
He's instructing you along the way. The Holy Spirit of God, when you come close to stepping in that hole, will stop right there and say, stop! Don't drop there. That's what God wants to do. But if you're not willing to obey Him and live a life of obedience, then you're just pretty much telling Him, you hold back there, I'll check in with you periodically. God says, I want to be right there as you're walking. So please, let today, if nothing else happens, be the day where you settle your relationship with Jesus and where you commit to him to obey him wherever that leads.